it really makes the effort of being a true summary of the state of knowledge. The idea is, once and for all, to say if you're standing on the human quest, you're standing on such an enormous, enormous mountain of empirical evidence that you can say that there's zero uncertainty that we need action, and that science can speak with one voice. We're trying to erase uncertainty by saying that, okay, in each, in each scientific discipline, from climate science to oceanography and hydrology, <coughs> there is, of course, uncertainty of the risks we're facing. But if you put all the environmental evidence on the table and its coupling to human well-being, you could almost argue today, which we do in the book, that there's zero uncertainty that we need a transition to global sustainability that has to happen fast. The second thing is that we like to see this as, as more of a kind of a reference and archive book for leveraging change. So even though it's a, it's a thick book with beautiful pictures, the idea is that it should be a, a tool for dialogue, a tool for roundtable discussions, a tool for curricula in different universities or, or high schools. So um, even though it's a kind of a, a thick volume, it should be used as a tool for deeper insights. I mean, the concluding remark in the whole book is that we're providing the evidence that humanity needs a paradigm shift. We need to reconnect our societies with planet Earth, and we need to recognize that you know, now is the time to be stewards and to preserve the remaining beauty on Earth, which may sound like a, like a bit of a kind of an esoteric target, but we're recognizing that there's so much evidence that this is a hard strategic target, because preserving the beauty on Earth means preserving the redundancy and the remaining biodiversity, the landscapes we have, and the ability to produce food, to secure fresh water, and a stable climate. So there's, there's, there's something very strategic around taking even those photos seriously in terms of a tool for our own prosperity. So the, the original analysis was global, and, and the, the, the purpose was to say water, the global hydrological cycle is clearly a regulatory function for the stability on Earth. We've known that for, for centuries. However, we've never tried to quantify how much can humanity interfere the entire system before we're starting to see, for example, so much change in evaporative return flows that it changes the content of water vapor in the atmosphere and it changes rainfall patterns to a point where you could destabilize biomass growth on the world and destabilize the greenhouse effect in the atmosphere. So that was our take on landing at, at a global number. Recognizing, though, that David Molden and many other uh, water colleagues are absolutely right, that water is only relevant at the local to regional scale, because that's where water is flowing through the landscapes. And that we have many basins in the world where the rivers are not reaching the ocean anymore. These, these basins are closed or closing. So what we're doing right now, in fact, right as we speak, is, is preparing a, a plant development 2.0, uh, which will be published hopefully early next year, where we're coupling, where relevant, each boundary with the global, the global original boundary definition with a regional boundary definition. And, and for water, not surprisingly, it will be an effort of trying to define what is the, the, the sustainable threshold in terms of water withdrawals at the basin scale, beyond which we start seeing abrupt changes. And then you would be able to say, okay, at the global level, it looks still as if we're in a safe operating space. We're, we're not jeopardizing the stability of the Earth system. But here we have two, three hotspot regions in the world where we've really pushed the system too far. So, so the idea is to respond to that criticism by putting a regional boundary to the global boundary. We live in a paradigm where we believe there's growth without any limits. That's, after all, the paradigm we have. In the 70s, the idea was that there's limits to growth and that we somehow have to recognize that. What we're trying to communicate now is that there are no limits to growth. We have to have growth within limits. And that's, that's the shift in the paradigm. So I think we need to experiment with very many ways of communicating that.